Hello, friends and colleagues, and welcome to the Tourism Skill Shop, hosted by State of Washington Tourism, SWT. My name is Matthew Ozuna, and I am the Destination Development Manager at SWT. I will introduce today's webinar on agritourism. Please utilize the chat function in Zoom to say hello and let us know where you're Zooming in from today. Feel free to share your uh, questions and comments in the chat box anytime during the webinar. You can also utilize the Q&A feature near the end of the webinar. Mike Mo will also be joining us today. He is the Director of Strategic Partnerships and Tourism Development at SWT. Mike will monitor the chat and help address questions from the audience near the end of the webinar. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know about the Tourism Skill Shop, let me tell you more about this webinar series. The Tourism Skill Shop is one of many industry educational programs from State of Washington Tourism. This webinar series will engage with colleagues across the tourism sector and broaden their industry knowledge, skills, and network. Each webinar will highlight a specific issue or skill for tourism professionals to ponder and discuss with industry experts. State of Washington Tourism will host live webinars of the Tourism Skill Shop on the third or fourth Thursday of every month from 10 to 11 a.m. These webinars are free and open to all tourism stakeholders. The webinars are also recorded and shared with registrants as well as other users on the SWT YouTube channel. For Tourism Skill Shop and other industry updates, visit the SWT industry website sign up for the industry update newsletter, and follow SWT on LinkedIn. Tourism stakeholders may also join the SWT Facebook group to, uh, for further discussion on topics related to the Tourism Skill Shop and other industry news issues and events. Okay, so let's uh, talk about agritourism, the focus of today's webinar. Today's webinar will examine the policies and planning associated with agritourism. Over the past few decades, products and services characterized as agritourism have grown in popularity. Fueled by people seeking authentic farm experiences and sustainable living, the size of the global agritourism market is protected to reach 111.1 billion US dollars by 2032. Revitalizing rural communities while preserving farmland and agrarian lifestyles. Now is the time for agriculturalists and other tourism stakeholders to start exploring policy and planning options for agritourism. In this webinar, attendees will learn about the latest trends, resources, and examples involving agritourism. An expert panel of tourism practitioners will share their insights on this phenomenon while developing or devoting special attention to product development and diversification, partnerships, and marketing. Panelists include Chadley Hollis, Principal Consultant and research, Researcher at uh, Cultivating Tourism, a boutique firm specializing in rural tourism and agritourism, and Anne Trenholm, an agri, uh, Agricultural Promotions Coordinator with the main Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about our speakers today. Um, and uh, we'll get to Anne and Chadley in just a moment, I, I promise. Um, but after growing up in rural Texas, Chadley studied tourism management and embarked on a career that allowed him to work with hotels and events around the world. In his consulting role, Chadley supports tourism initiatives with research and outreach, strategic planning, as well as network and community building. He can help with business management, hospitality experience design, and place-based marketing too. Chadley is also the founding secretary of the Global Agritourism Network. And I, if you folks, if you don't know what this is, uh, Mike will pop the link into the chat. It's a great organization. And I wish I attended uh, the latest conference in Italy on agritourism with this group. Um, and he is a member on the board of directors of Travel Unity, a 501c3 organization that works to support diversity, equity, and inclusion in the tourism sector. In addition to all of this work, Chadley is a PhD student and a presidential fellow at the University of Georgia. Chadley, thank you for joining us today. <clears throat> um, and now we'll uh, uh, spotlight Anne. Um, and Anne, you're a Mainer. I know a few Mainers and uh, I haven't been to Maine yet, but eventually I'll get up there and make it to the Maine Lobster Festival. I promise, one day. Maine has a rich agricultural heritage and farms. 
Uh, and these continue to drive economic activity in the pine tree state, especially in rural communities. Anne's job is to coordinate the state's promotional efforts related to agriculture. These include agricultural fairs and trade shows, open farm day, and other events. She manages the Real Maine uh, Promotions and Agritourism Branding Program and supports domestic and international trade opportunities for farms in Maine. Panelists, thanks again. I'm excited to dive into agritourism. Before we do, I just have some intro slides to provide uh, attendees with a bit more context of our topic today and to highlight a few uh, grant opportunities uh, from State of Washington Tourism that they can use for agricultural products or uh, projects like this. So uh, Chadley and Ann will get back to you shortly. I will share my screen and my slide deck. I'll make sure my slides are from the beginning. They are. Share my screen now. Okay, folks, I hope you can see this first slide. Welcome to the Tourism Skill Shop and our webinar on agritourism today, really focusing on the planning and policy side of this. I ha just have a few slides. I want to touch on a few basic concepts just so we know what we're talking about um, as it relates to agritourism. Uh, there's some common challenges. That's kind of been consistent over the last few years. And, and then the folks that I talk to around the state there are also plenty of resources right here in Washington and elsewhere, um, and Chadley and Ann are, are evidence of that. And then lastly, State of Washington Tourism has destination planning and, and development grants. If you're looking for some extra help and professional expertise in this arena, you can utilize those grants um, for an agritourism project, perhaps. Okay, so what is agritourism? Well, it's a lot of things, and um, there's Plenty of definitions out there, including legal ones uh, right here. Washington State has its own it codified into law. However, uh, researchers and academics have kind of put this together. I've seen this shared um, uh, with many folks across the country. It, it's a great visual representation of um, what agritourism means at its core and other activities uh, that are associated with it uh, on the periphery. Um, so feel free to utilize this in any of your stakeholder meetings or presentations when you're trying to kind of tackle agritourism. Uh, the more you're focused in on the core, you're focused uh, on experiences that happen on farms uh, at uh, agritourism um, uh, properties. So keep that in mind, on farm experiences, products and services. As you kind of move out from the core, it gets uh, either you have more freedom with fishing and hunting, even wedding venues. Um, so it just depends uh, on the time and place uh, of where all of these things take uh, take place. Now, uh, categories, uh, just to be clear, usually they're broken down in five hospitality, education, direct sales, entertainment and outdoor recreation. And we'll be talking uh, about all of these things as they relate to agritourism. We'll sprinkle in examples in these categories throughout our presentation today. And just to be clear too, agritourism enterprises, um, you might focus uh, or an enterprise might start up focusing on in one of these categories, but now uh, uh, agritourism enterprises are becoming uh, more and more uh, diversified in their products and in, uh, in their services, what they offer. So they're not just, um, uh, multi or they're they're multifaceted. For instance, uh, a lavender farm um, has flowers that could uh, are you pick, but they also have lavender soap and and um, lavender lavender lotion. They could even partner with another farm down the road, uh, maybe a, a goat farm, and have uh, lavender goat milk uh, lotion, um, things of that nature. So. Um, Agritourism enterprises can also have event venues on site uh, so you can eat and drink and be entertained too. So all of these things are fascinating uh, in the arena of agritourism. And I know Chadley has a few examples of these. However, there are some challenges, time management, uh, when you're trying to run a business, 
uh, and, and work um, uh, with animals or crops or, or even marketing is another issue that we come uh, that comes up quite a bit. Liability issues, I've heard that many times. Um, state and local regulations. We'll talk about that a little later in a slide uh, that I have for you. I think uh, Chadley has some uh, best practices or some advice for you to navigate uh, these regulations later on in the webinar. Uh, like I said, there's some great agritourism resources right here in Washington State, starting with uh, the state's uh, Department of Agriculture. Regional Markets Program is a, a great um, resource to help small farms and uh, agritourism businesses. Um, there's also the Green Book, which I'm diving into. I'm comparing uh, the Green Book with the Oregon Agritourism Handbook, uh, a complete set of everything that you need to do to start a business, uh, marketing, um, partnerships, things like that in this book that's actually online and uh, the links embedded in this presentation. You'll get these PowerPoint slides as well as those from Chadley and Anne um, in a follow-up email within a day or two. Um, and if you uh, would like to contact um, the Washington State Department of Agriculture, you have Misha's contact information at the bottom of the page. There is also a thing called Eat Local First, and uh, Marissa is probably on the call today. She might chime in later in the webinar too during the Q&A session, but this is a, a great organization with a great tool that connects uh, local producers um, with visitors and residents uh, direct to consumer and it helps develop other kind of partnerships around the state and providing other resources uh, and support. The Washington Food Finder is a great example of that. It lists um, agritourism opportunities across the state, which other which folks, um, DMOs, chambers, other folks can kind of tie into and help promote. Uh, there's also plenty of listings and um, uh, 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 spotlights for food trails, you pick farms, uh, things of that nature. And last year, they actually were uh, held roundtable discussions with um, folks, uh, agricultural tourism uh, folks around the state in 2023. Uh, there's These have been recorded. I believe there's uh, notes as well. You can see uh, the status on that and how these regions and these products and services uh, are kind of relating to one another and supporting um, their regional areas as well. And Marissa's contact information is at the bottom of the page. Here's an advertisement that will go up in SeaTac from Eat Local First. This will um, be later. This will be uh, at SeaTac later this year. And then, lastly, there are some um, some help uh, uh, with uh, state uh, state law that can help agritourism enterprises. Like I said earlier, there's a lot of definitions for agritourism, legal definitions around uh, the country. Washington has its own. There's a link for that. There's a warning label or notice too that can help uh, folks on farms and in other agritourism enterprises with li liability issues. Last I was looking at these um, uh, RCWs, there was um, some uh, updating of a of Senate Bill uh, 5808. So. Uh, more information there, and you can always dig into uh, liability issues, concerns at the National Agricultural Law Center. Federal grants. So State of Washington Tourism received um, $3.5 million uh, to help with destination planning and development. Uh, these grants have, will start this year and roll into next year. Um, there's nine grant opportunities. Today, I'm going to focus on one, technical assistance. The catch is all of this money has to be spent by the end of next year. So make sure you're organizing, you're, uh, you're getting your grants written well in advance and you're asking the right questions from SWT staff or other local DMO staff or uh, tourism consultants. Um, these grants are only for uh, uh, governments and, and nonprofit organizations. So if you are a small business on the call today, uh, agri uh, agritourism enterprise, Unfortunately, you cannot apply for these grants, but you can be part of a larger um, grant project if it has to do with a, a larger marketing campaign for agritourism in a region, a, a food trail map, things, things of that nature. Um, if you sign up to the Washington State Industry Update newsletter, you'll, you'll get updates of when these um, applications or these grant opportunities are available. They usually, the application period is usually a month uh, once we collect all of the applications, they're vetted uh, by a review committee. 
Um, there is a slight delay in, with, the, with the funding because we have to go through Commerce who has the funds, um, but it's really important uh, that contractors uh, be billed on a reimbursement basis. The, the work has to be done first and then they can be, paid, can be paid. Every dollar spent needs to match a receipt. So a lot of oversight and reporting here. Uh, you can't use uh, th these monies for staff salaries. The project timeline is also fairly, uh, fairly short within uh, 12 months, but the good news is there's no match required. Like I said, technical assistance is probably the grant for you. Um, if you're working, if you're interested on an agri-tourism related project, um, this grant allows you to uh, bring in technical uh, professional expertise, someone like a Chadley Hollis to come and help you do research, analyze data, conduct stakeholder meetings, uh, and put together perhaps a, a written document of recommendations moving forward, a plan for agri-tourism in your neck of the woods. You can request $15,000. Again, folks, there's no match required. But if you do have an in-kind match uh, with volunteer time, materials, that will help your application as well, uh, and as well as maybe a, a cash match. All right, I think that's it for me. Um, we'll have more time for questions and answers about these grants and uh, agritourism at the end of the webinar. Chadley, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Thanks, Matt. Um, hi, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Matt, would you mind confirming you can hear me all right? I can hear you, I can see you, but not your slide deck. Yeah, they're coming. There we go. How about now? Maybe there's a delay. Does everything look okay? Uh, I don't see your slide deck. Interesting. Let's see here. It worked in our press. press I know. Session. So nothing, huh? See, are you make sure you're a panelist? Oh, you know why? <laughs> Here we go. Oh, yep. There we go. User error. And I'm gonna. And can you confirm you can see just the the slide, the front slide, planning yes. for agriculture in rural yep. communities? Correct. Yep. Just that first slide. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, thanks for joining everyone. Uh, I'm excited that um, uh, to be talking to you today. I, I told Matt before I love Washington. Uh, I've had the pleasure of seeing at least three corners of the state. Um, I need to see central Washington. But uh, anyways, um, happy to be here today. And so for today, for my portion, we're going to talk a little bit about me, just a quick overview of who I am, where I come from, that sort of thing. Uh, what we know about agritourism and a little bit about what we don't know. Uh, making the case for support that's, you know, regulations and, 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 and more um, uh, technical support, whatever it may be, and then go into some case studies. One example internationally, um, a recent experience I had with Albania, and then a deeper dive after that uh, with my colleague Anne in Maine. So uh, first about me, uh, this is me before uh, starting a farm and uh, having a toddler. Uh, and uh, that's Heidi there. I have to give credit to Heidi. She's no longer with us. She was a great goat, uh, but that gives you a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Chadley. Um, I started my career in hospitality hotels, um, had the pleasure of working uh, in California, uh, Texas, London, um, and then uh, on events, uh, large scale events around the world, and then uh, ended up at a small rural DMO, which I really loved and wish I could have stayed longer. And but before that, if you zoom out a little bit, uh, you learn a little bit about my my upbringing, which, as Matt mentioned, is in rural Texas uh, on a, a small cattle ranch. Um, it was where I was happiest. And then I had a short uh, career in the tourism sector and then found my way farming uh, with my now wife. Uh, we had a goat dairy started in Vermont, moved and actually started operating and selling cheese in Texas. That also was uh, shorter lived than we like, uh, but it uh, while we were doing that, I was focused on maintaining that connection with tourism and agriculture. And I have found myself 
uh, fortunately, with a lot of colleagues around the country um, and working on projects with leading universities, nonprofits, um, uh, government institutions, and even private, uh, the private sector on understanding, sharing knowledge about, um, just generally getting and, and providing resources for and support for uh, agritourism. And so um, we know a lot about, I'm gonna start getting into it now. So we know a lot about rural communities, farmers and agritourism businesses, but not so much about the agritourist, where they travel, how frequently they engage with farm businesses. And this is um, from my training in, in the tourism world, this is the complete opposite of our data knowledge in the, in the broader tourism sector. Um, we have a lot of resources for, um, you know, whether it be, you know, transaction data, uh, geolocation data, all these different resources that we have to track um, to, to track travelers. Uh, but with agritourism, we don't. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of a background of why I think this is and why it, it makes, you know, um, supporting agritourism and engaging with it a little bit more difficult. So we start with different institutional patterns. I'm going to break up agritourism into its two parts, agri and tourism. And first, the agri part, the agriculture, um, you know, agriculture has a history of institutional support of production agriculture. Of course, this is with the USDA, and it goes back since the founding of the USDA. In the 1990s, we saw this push towards rural development, and it really put rural livelihood in the spotlight. And the USDA started to focus on more than just production agriculture, on what it actually meant to have a rural livelihood and to, to make a livelihood um, in a rural environment. This started a focus on capacity building, applied research, and of course, extension services and universities. Uh, really, the, while they existed, they really started to focus on not just plant breeding and things like that, but also um, rural livelihood. Um, and as a result, there's a strength in public investment in the agricultural sector. And that's evident through countless numbers of um, uh, you can look at any any data about agri agriculture in the U.S. and see how much public support we have. Whereas on the tourism side, of course, there's an op uh, traditionally there was an op uh, a localized emphasis on overnight visitation, um, a strong body of research on the economic multiplier effects, visitor research, and all of this new money that we always talk about that tourism brings into an economy. And as a result, this has been a strength in marketing through private investment little development. And I know that the, tour, the the hotel tax is is public money, but it's used for a specific uh, case. So I don't really consider it public money. It's It um, goes in one gate and out the same gate. <laughs> and so uh, as a result of these different institutional patterns, there's different market outcomes. And, and, and these different contrasting stories result in different things. And so first with agriculture, you get a community that seeks institutional support. You have law, a large uh, set of farmers around the US that actually are very knowledgeable about the way the USDA works, how the, how the funding works, how they can get funding, um, how their crops align with it and all of that. Uh, in addition to that, you, get, you have an integrated feedback system of, of research, policymaking and development. Right, the, the researchers are heavily embedded in the communities um, there, and it's it's very well connected to policy making and how rural places develop and how agriculture develops, um, and this this results in um, well, it's, it also resulted in the motivations are, are revenue and but also product diversification driven uh, in the agricultural sector, whereas with tourism we get localized marketing that's that's really localized. We 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 do have a you know, a national tourism office, so to speak, um, not as strong as other countries, but we do have it. It's also uh, focused a lot on Main Street heritage. Significant resources are, are dedicated to that and have been in the past. Um, there's also a, a strong uh, emphasis on the private sector alone, um, and that results in a strength in marketing uh, and then not so much the management and development. Again, this is traditionally, and it is changing. It's actively changing. You're starting to see more and more uh, states invest in people like Matt who do on the ground development work um, that is relatively new from my perspective in the tourism world. And so my argument here is that when you combine them, they're better together. The agri and agritourism can learn from tourism. It can Agriculture can learn about localized and stronger marketing, uh, emphasis on heritage, right, that tourism does so well with. 
um, but the agriculture sector really doesn't. Uh, a stronger engagement with a broader private sector, with research and things like that. Um, I think agritourism, um, and, and it may come soon, who knows, but but I think private sector research um, that, that actually helps us understand agritourism better. And also tourism can learn from agriculture um, about seeking institutional support and understanding how, how our, our tourism offices and how our, um, our, our government entities or nonprofits, whoever it is, how they can integrate into this, this broader, you know, tourism development uh, infrastructure. And so um, together, I do think they're better. It's a way for farmers and ranchers to rebuild lost value into products. You know, you have, you know, traditional uh, production agriculture that's focused on a, you know, maybe just the product and not the value added product. Right. Yeah. And, and agritourism helps them, helps them build in that. Uh, motivations are revenue and enterprise diversification driven with little institutional support still in agritourism. Uh, it is a burgeoning sector. Um, it's new. Um, there's a, most of the institutional support is really about understanding it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and of course, um, in the U.S., there's a focus on direct sales and product based activities and events. Um, you know, in other countries, um, as, as I'll talk about later, you know, there's there's different styles of agritourism. If you look at that wheel that Matt showed you, um, you know, different areas, different regions, different countries typically tend to, to gravitate towards certain areas of that wheel. And so um, my my big question here then is how do we make the case for support? And when I mean support, I mean policy, I mean research, I mean all these things. But to me, it's about comprehension and collaboration. And um, let me see here. Okay, so yeah, comprehension first is is about is about understanding agritourism. It's about actually understanding the definitions, the demographics, the motivations. Uh, that's on the provider side. But then on the supply side, demand, uh, you know, supply consumers and and understanding what makes them want to visit a particular place. Um, is it the products? Is it the experience? That sort of thing. Um, and this is this is a, this is done through research and and taking that research and 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 sharing it through outreach. And so our comprehension is limited at the moment, uh, but the amount of research being undertaken is growing. And we have limited knowledge, but we do have some. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start to go in with this comprehension bit to try to help us comprehend agritourism a little bit better through the data that we do have. And so the first thing I want to talk about is institutional research from the USDA. Uh, the USDA puts out the USDA Census of Agriculture, as many of you maybe are aware. Um, and I have here uh, the percent change from the last USDA Census, which is in 2017, to the one that was just released in 20, uh, um, so, sorry, in February uh, from the 2022 Census. Um, and, and we see that agritourism uh, as, as a dollar amount in the U.S., as the USDA defines it, I'll talk about that in a second, but um, as the USDA defines it, is up 33%, which is which is crazy. I think it's the largest increase maybe since um, uh, that we've seen. It, it might not be, but it's, it's pretty high. Um, and then we saw that the number of farms, though, was flat. The number of farms didn't grow, but income was up from agritourism. Now, I include direct sales in here because me and a lot of my colleagues like to include direct sales in agritourism numbers, because if you notice on that wheel, direct sales is included there. And we think it's an important part of what makes a place attractive and what makes people want to visit. And so direct sales, according to the census in the U.S., broadly speaking, uh, was up 16 percent over that five year period. But the number of uh, direct number of farms offering direct sales from 2017 to 2022 was down 10 percent. This is interesting to us. Um, we don't know why, um, because during the pandemic, we saw an increase. Uh, but we're wondering that after the pandemic, when this when the census was um, was actually undertaken uh, in 2022, there was a decrease. Um, so happy to talk about that in more detail. I don't have the answer. Uh, but next is Washington. So they have a state by state breakdown um, of these data as well. And so <laughs> Washington has some pretty crazy growth numbers um, from 2017 to 2022. Um, the, the dollar amount is almost 100 percent more than it was in 2022 than it was in 2017 uh, for agritourism. And then the number of farms was up 15 percent. So you're still seeing a lot more income per farm. Um, and and um, yeah. And then for direct sales, again, a lot of direct sales money 
almost 50% increase, and then actually uh, larger than um, larger than national average, I guess, um, uh, decrease in the number of farms. But the farms that are still offering direct sales, according to the census, um, is um, is up. So um, that is that is some institutional research that we have available to us, and it comes every five years. And so some recent recent academic research um, is is about definitions, right? Um, and we've learned a lot about the definitions that we use across the across the U.S. And what we've learned is that our current definitions just aren't adequate. Uh, previous studies of agritourism hot, uh, indicated some hotspots using the USDA USDA definition. Uh, really shows that that the hotspots aren't accurate, and we can provide these papers to you if you if you if you want to get into and read them yourself. I can also provide a summary. Um, but for example, uh, Washington was not a hotspot. Um, but then, whenever you look at the next paper that agritourism is not measured properly, you know the reality is that that certain parts of Washington are hotspots when you include things like direct sales. Um, and, and 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 kind of expand that agritourism definition beyond what the USDA uh, defines it as. Um, and then uh, we also know that profitability is related to offering events and entertainment and on-farm direct sales. Now it's activity dependent and it's also contextually dependent. Um, we this is from a, a survey that had about two thousand respondents. It was not nationally representative, which uh, if you've ever done survey research, it's really hard to get a nationally representative sample uh, for the states, um, for each state, I mean. And so, um, you know, the, 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 the activities that are that are uh, more profitable in in uh, Skagit County, Washington, are probably a lot different than um, um, I don't know Georgia or 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 Maine or Texas or or anywhere else in the U.S. And so. Um, but to understand profitability more and, and how we actually, um, how the farmers are able to succeed in agritourism, we, we ha it has to be more heavily replicated locally uh, because it's context dependent. And then of course, some other uh, recent research that came out of uh, Oregon State University, um, they recently published an initial economic impact study that highlights an over $1 billion impact, uh, $1 billion impact of agritourism on the Oregon economy. Um, so, that's Oregon specifically, though, and they they had a very valiant effort, and we all watched them and cheered them along because I think every state in the U.S. wants to do this. It's it just takes a lot of resources um, and and a lot of sort of teamwork and collaboration that I'll I'll talk about in a minute. But um, but but with more studies like this um, in other states, other regions, even locally. Um, we find, I think we find similar data that, that it really does have a, a, um, a big impact on our economy. And then as far as outreach goes, I have to share these. These are, this is a result of a recent project that, um, that I was a part of with uh, Penn State. Um, there, uh, this is the, the 2017 census data that we put in some pretty format for all of you to look at. Um, and to understand a little bit more about agritourism. I won't get into detail on why there's four different uh, um, um, fact sheets, but the reality is some farms offer direct sales, some offer agritourism, and we created these fact sheets from a special request of the data um, that's not publicly available, but um, but uh, we made a, a fact, we made fact sheets for every state. And so I encourage you to scan this uh, QR code and I'll provide the link to Matt um, and, and even the PDFs for that matter um, after this, and we can email them to you um, whenever this webinar is over. And then, oops. And so um, this research, all of this research helps us advocate. And we found in 2021 in a study that, um, in the, the study that I mentioned, that most farms, the most common um, um, sort of needs and, and needs for support that farms had was first marketing and business development. And then the second one re was regulatory liability and things like that. And so, you know, advocating for agritourism, I think is easy from the heart. Um, um, but when you, when you go to actually show how important it is, there's so many things that can change your argument that can change whether or not you'll have success. And uh, the first of those um, is definitions, right? So we, as Matt mentioned, we have 
you know, uh, we have a sort of national definition that the USDA uses in the census to collect data. I would argue it's not it's not uh, accurate. Um, and you have your Washington um, uh, definition that may or may not be, um, you know, a good uh, way to look at agritourism. But examples of how these issues will arise and, and the things that you'll encounter will vary based on how you define uh, agritourism. And it's important to remember, too, that, um, you know, as Matt mentioned, the protection against liability, um, you know, a lot of research has helped us understand um, what prevents people from from engaging in agritourism? And this was early research that it was, you know, this this fear of liability. So now almost all, I think Iowa was, no, I can't remember. Regardless, there's like one state left or, or, or maybe not anymore, but um, almost all states uh, have a sort of um, a, a liability protection statute. And I will just say, I know um, it, we're not farmers here, but, but the, um, uh, this li these liability statutes, as far as I'm concerned, have not been tested in court. So we we hope they stand up. <laughs> we uh, we don't know yet. Um, but and and but we've also learned that um, through some recent uh, court cases that things like a right to farm law um, that that protect um, farms from um, leg uh, litigation for smells or noises and things like that. Uh, agritourism has been found in court not to fall under the right to farm law. And so that that also prevents a bar barrier um, and, and understanding that and understanding how that impacts our community helps us to see, uh, to really see how we can support our farms, how we can advocate for them and for our rural communities in general. And then, of course, um, agricultural exemptions vary with with um, with uh, whenever you get into an agritourism business, you're becoming a hospitality business. You're not, um, you know, that that income is not farm income. And so there's a lot of stuff that that prevents people from engaging in agritourism or being public about it and that sort of thing. Um, and so and the last thing I want to mention about this is that the uh, we did a uh, an analysis with some data um, that that showed us that and there's a publication for this that um, that farms in the Western US, that includes Washington, um, were found more likely to have limits to access regarding re regulations, permitting, and liability. And so I think when we think about if we want to support, you know, rural communities and support agritourism in our communities, um, you know, how do we make sure that the people that want to be entrepreneurs, that want to diversify their product stream, how can we be sure that they can proceed in a confident sort of, um, yeah, a confident way, knowing that they're not going to lose their business or, and so, you know, making these permitting regulations and things like that more easily uh, understood um, is, is, um, is important. And so I want to clarify, though. That I am not telling you to do this. <laughs> you're, you're, not, you're not a lawyer, are you, Chad? Like, <laughs> I understand that your lives are busy. You've got communities in every part of your county or your state or whatever it is, and and people that are probably I I in in a smaller community where I was, I can't tell you the number of people that walked into my door and just had problems with tourism, this tourism, that, and um, yeah, I understand. <laughs> so I'm not telling you to go make policy with farms or, or you know, that sort of thing. That's where I believe that the best way to do this is together. And so utilize people who are experts in your region, in your area, in their particular area um, to make things better for the community, make things easier for agritourism operators. Um, partnerships between extension, of course, DMOs, nonprofits, policymakers, are becoming more common, but I believe they still need to become more common and even more common. Um, as a result of existing partnerships collectively, we've we've been focused on data aggregation and understanding what agritourism operators, and I say we, I mean everyone, even some folks in Washington who are doing agritourism research and outreach, um, you know, we're trying to understand what agritourism is, what, you know, what operators need and what the communities need uh, in order to succeed. And so um, I, again, lean on the strengths, going back to what I said earlier, lean on the strengths of the agriculture community and the tourism community. You know things that they don't know and they know things that you don't know. So I encourage you to reach out to your county extension agent, things like that, to really help collaboration be key. 
And so a little bit more about collaboration, because that's where we're moving, and that's going to be the main topic of our case studies. Um, and I, I just believe, and I, I, I've been preaching this this uh, this gospel for about two years now about collaboration and and how it's vital for agritourism. Um, you know, social capital, networking, uh, and partnerships, as we know, are are an integral part of the viability of rural communities. We can't be isolated. They can't be isolated from each other, and especially if they rely on this urban rural linkage that oftentimes rural tourism communities do. And so, um, you know, forming these and these networks um, are also a factor in entrepreneurship. If if entrepreneurs or potential entrepreneurs feel um, alone, uh, which oftentimes farming can feel pretty alone, you know, the the um, they they may not do it. Um, they may feel like they're not um, you know supported enough or or that it's too risky or what have you and if you don't have entrepreneurs you don't have this positive change in communities you start to lose communities you start to lose the fabric that really holds them together um, but it's difficult um, creating these um, these networks is a challenge um, and I I I think again it's you know the agritourism is different no matter which or whatever direction you look it's different um, and I think um this this creates a challenge and i again i'm not telling you to do this i'm i'm telling you to reach out to folks to form partnerships um to to um make it clear what your strengths are and and find out what other people's strengths are in your community well good um, chadley let's go yeah. show this where this is working do you have can you kind of do a deep dive with a few minutes that you have left before we go to ann can you talk about your work in albania or more specifically yeah. in maine yeah, yeah. Thank you, Matt. So um, in Albania, I want to I want to kind of talk a little bit more about what uh, what I think a successful collaboration um, looks like. And and this is a, a multi year deal. I, I, I am I am sharing someone else's story. I should be be up front there, too. I recently visited Albania with colleagues of mine and, and explored, had meetings and, and, and visited farms uh, across the entire small country. Um, over over a week's time frame, and um, and I I genuinely believe that they are they have the most intentional and sort of comprehensive agritourism development that I, a program that I'm aware of. And so, just a, a bit of a background, and then I'll talk about um, each of um, uh, just some specific collaboration uh, techniques that they've um, sort of used intentionally or otherwise. Um, so, of course, you have the challenge in Albania for former Soviet. Um, uh, territory that 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 had to retrain. I'm not going to get into the history, but basically uh, the way the land uh, split up um, happened after the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, it, it, it forced them to have to retrain their rural livelihood and their rural traditions and their rural food and their food, uh, sorry, food culture. And the last generation really had little relationship to the land from a cultural standpoint. It was purely productive. Um, and and so when the Soviet was um, Union uh, split up, uh, land was was just split up evenly and you couldn't do much with the land. Um, and so over time, they've started to get creative and they've really taken in Albania a systems approach. So the systems approach is about bringing together different sectors, stakeholders uh, and disciplines, which is important. Uh, to arrive at this common understanding um, and, and emerging opportunities to understand how they can actually achieve all of these like, you know, um, lofty outcomes that they want, these, these, this, this positive future for rural Albania. And so this is with entrepreneurs, branding and marketing, uh, local food products, um, environmentally friendly agriculture, um, local culture and traditions, empowering women, um, increasing agricultural literacy and so much more that they're trying to do to really, you know, um, to showcase what what rural life is all about. Um, and so this project included everything from product development to even landscape design and food safety and things like that. Um, so uh, they did an in-depth product study uh, as a part of this, and then they had a large part of it was capacity building that was through the needs of the operators. But Last but not least, their biggest and I think most effective tool was collaboration. So I'll talk a little bit more about that first. First, institutional collaboration. And this was a this this project was a strong collaboration between 
uh, an international development uh, agency from Germany, which is unique, I get, but I th think there's a lesson to be learned there, a university and the ministries of ag and tourism together. And so they, they really ran this program together, um, different sources of funding, different sources of, of, of knowledge and expertise. They had workshops and trainings together. Um, again, like I said about landscape design, uh, hospitality, food safety, all the things that in landscape design is, is uh, when, I, when I do technical training, I talk a lot about flow, which I think is really one of the most important things when you're trying to design an experience. And so that's really what it's all about. It's about how the space uh, sort of envelops you or doesn't uh, and how to improve that. Um, and so, and most importantly, thing I love the most is that the agriculture and tourism ministries at the top level are working together and they're literally in the same room and they had a great uh, meeting with both of them in the same room and it was it was fantastic. They're, ta they're tackling the task together. And then of course, collaborative promotion. It was the creation of an agritourism association that is really strong. They've started to do collaborative events together on the farms, uh, product-based collaboration, as Matt mentioned for the lavender goat milk soap, um, but things like that, selling each other's products and a really, really strong social media network um, that, that can't be understated of them just, uh, pardon my language, just not shutting up about agritourism in Albania and it's they're, they're passionate and I think that's probably something you have to have is um, um, I think we've talked about in our discussions, Matt, before is that, you know, having champions uh, and, and maybe it was Anne that mentioned this, actually, people that are just relentlessly for whatever it is and willing to give whatever it takes. Uh, but it also doesn't start stop with marketing. Marketing is only one part of it. And so I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm almost done here. Uh, but yeah, because uh, we have to bring in Anne soon, Chad. Yes, yes, yes. So wrap this so, up. And, and, so agritourism businesses are also an incubator. That on the left, you have uh, pictures of a very established 500,000 follower agritourism business. On the right, you have a newer agritourism operation not far from it. And when you, when you talk to them, you learn that this newer one was an employee, one of the first employees of this larger one. And they, um, they, they chalked it up to pay, they, they, pay their, uh, they pay their folks higher than the regular wage. Um, and then the larger farm actually, and the more established farm actually helped with, you know, um, the process of getting loans and, and you know, uh, really proving the market and showing that there's a market for added growth in the immediate community. And so that business served as an incubator for other businesses. And that's really important to build that entrepreneurial ecosystem. And um, I will just leave it at that. This is, we're going to go into deep dive and Anne's going to talk about uh, sort of the work we've been doing. I, made, I met Anne um, through a project through Vermont, but I was in Maine and, um, and we are, have now been working together for the, the last two years and yeah. we're still doing the project and I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Matt who, yeah. Thanks, Chadley. Hi, everyone. Um, so Matt is going to be my uh, slide uh, moderator, if you will. I will keep it pretty short and sweet. You'll have access to this information. But my goal in sharing what I have, and you can go start us right off, Matt, um, is just to share the four things that were really important to bringing Maine to the place where it is today after having it successfully created our first ever uh, agritourism summit and launching two agritourism courses that I have not run but was able to uh, create with Chadley with the help of some funding that I kind of found along the way. So I do work for the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. In itself, that's a great networking opportunity. It's very uh, broadly focused on natural resources. And I do come from a farming and agricultural background. I've managed a business. I have uh, experience before um, coming to the Department of Agriculture and working in our, our resources development division. So I'm not. I'm sharing that so that you know, like I have a lifetime of experience, and that was very helpful uh, to creating what we have today. So there's generations of effort on my own. Uh, but also generations of effort for people who came before me. And as we move forward to the next slide, you'll see that I have 
just truncated this into maybe like early 2000s or late uh, 2000s because life existed before um, I came to this job. And I, I cannot emphasize that enough. We have awesome um, rapport with Extension, uh, Department of Economic and Community Development, and certainly with the farmers. And that's who uh, has really been the focal point for me since I began my job in uh, 2018. So when we started with um, just this one critical piece, I will call it our Agritourism Summit and our courses, was really about conversations. So farmers were coming to me or maybe they were coming to Humane Extension or tourism organizations and saying, you know, what do we do? You know, could you do this? What's possible? And it focused on different topics, risk management, business planning, marketing. And we received that information oftentimes by informal polls. So in 2019, we had uh, the 30th anniversary of Maine's Open Farm Day. And I started using that as a goal for myself to see what could we do to help the farmers and how could we get type, the type of information that they need. I combined that with this national survey, which you'll be able to see the link on, I think when you get these slides and it's, it's a little bit of the, about the survey that Chadley mentioned, but there are really two focus areas for Maine, um, risk management and promotional support. So we can move forward to the next slide. And you'll see that we've highlighted promotional outreach. And these are just, again, some of the recent highlights. So 2000 to present, because we did have a strong promotional uh, program. If we think about what Misha has done, um, even what Marissa has done. So it kind of falls in those veins, if you will. And I've highlighted um, kind of milestones really since 2000. And before we even got to the course, we had three things. We had a, a brand re-update, uh, excuse me, reevaluation and update, which allowed us to add on online trip itineraries. Farmers requested, you know, how do we have ways for people to visit our farm? How do we make it easier for clustering, things like that? And then farmers also wanted to introduce a fiber touring trail and then an ice cream trail. So before we even got to creating a course, I needed to have little uh, baby uh, steps, little small infrastructure options for any type of farm in Maine who wanted to find a way to raise agricultural awareness. And that is our, our umbrella opportunity for all types of farms in Maine. And I would argue agritourism has that responsibility, if you will, across the US and probably other parts of the globe too. So if we move on to the next slide, you'll see um, that we started also developing educational re resources and tools for farmers and then concluded with our summit and of course, a few other courses. And throughout all these uh, you know, milestones in my short time here since 2018, we've been able to focus on topics like biosecurity. We've been able to make introductions to staff that I've basically personally called up at tourism uh, agencies or partner orgs, wh whether they're state or, or something that receives a grant from the state and ask them, you know, what do you think is interesting? And and kind of share the messaging, bridging that messaging of, you know, this is the quality of place and space. We know that people are coming for this landscape. We know that Maine is a food destination. It's not just one area. How do we help you create the messaging that allows people to stay here longer, get out of those high traffic areas, and then support the farmers who want to feel valued by being a small business and create those relationships, not just between the farmers, but perhaps other businesses in town. So that's been the overarching goal um, for this. And I just wanted to share those pieces and I'm happy to open it up to questions alongside Chadley at this time. Great job, thanks, Anne. Yes, I had a great time exploring real Maine in the uh, itinerary builder. Um, good work. Okay, folks, we, uh, we'll stay on a little after 11, if folks can too, uh, to take your questions. Mike, are there any questions in the chat or in the Q&A? Uh, well, we had a uh, question earlier that was answered uh, capably by, by Anne. Um, we have another one from Jill. Can you share best practices of growing the growing relationship between um, Farmers and tourism stakeholders. Our farmers seem uninterested in agritourism. We have a lot of commodity farming, but not on small scale. So I think it's just how do you how do you um, encourage uh, farmers to to engage in in agritourism? 
Do you want me to take that, Chadley? Yeah, and if you, I have some thoughts, but if you want to go, I think, yeah. Yeah, so just so folks, if you aren't, if you are not aware, um, Maine, we've talked about similarities between Maine and Washington, right? We have a large chunk of Maine that maybe is focused on the commodity experience or, you know, that's how they're earning their living. They're trying to have people um, maybe be the next generation on the farm. And then we have places where it's uh, and more populated areas of Maine where it's, you know, that's where the easiest market is, right? You start out as a cut flower grower, a vegetable grower, and and there's a market there. So I think when we look at that agritourism wheel um, that was shown at the beginning of this slide, to me, that wheel is a great way to actually make the introduction. And I simply ask them, do you have a customer who wants to know more about your product and why you want to sell it? And that question is a, a pretty much every farmer, regardless of your scale or type, can answer yes. And I, I would say, particularly if you have um, maybe a restaurant that's in a more populated area, but you're using uh, grains or your grapes or wine from a, diff a place where maybe has a larger uh, wholesale or distribution and processing relationship, there's still agritourism opportunities. You can bring chefs to the farm. You can you can basically bring agricultural awareness. You have farm to institution. There's so many ways that everybody, regardless of your production capability and scale, needs to be focused on agricultural awareness. The numbers are pretty plain and clear. Thank you. I'm glad. Yes, the economic data. Yeah, I would say point to that because every farm, if they want to stay in business, they have to sell a product. Um, and so it's not necessarily about you know, the bed and breakfast, I think that was the biggest misconception that I've had. And, and Chadley and I have had course members in Maine, they have potatoes and berries and Christmas trees, you know, like they're doing a lot of different things, a lot larger size farm than, um, than farms in the Southern part of Maine, which I realize is all relative when we're talking about a farm in Maine versus a farm in Washington, but, but the practice still stands. If you have a contract um, and you're selling stuff on a forward contract versus you are doing all the marketing and your direct selling, you still need to sell a product and it matters um, what the perception is. But what would you add to that, Chadley? Yeah, that, my, my main point was really just going to be about value add, about understanding that you're, well, maybe a large part of your income or maybe all of it is focused on some commodity production. Um, um, there's always potential to take that, whether it be an educational experience, um, you know, are, are, is the family engaged? If the family is not engaged, why are they not engaged? Um, maybe it has something to do with the fact that it's all commodity agriculture and they want something different. Um, and so um, um, I don't think you should force people into agritourism, <laughs> uh, but but I think there's always opportunity to connect um, and and really, um, yeah, yeah. And, and said it great. So thank you. And I would just add to that when we look at um, farming, you know, there's different production preferences, methods, and um, promotional and marketing opportunities. But um, you know, to Chadley's point, and we've seen this elsewhere in Maine, it's um, it's a home rule state, so the municipal involvement, which I've been able to kind of curate um, when we have conversations with tourism folks, it's the planning piece, right? So whatever your local planning is and how that's set out, everyone's going to have a conversation about that. Um, and sometimes it looks different for different scales, but um, it's hard to start a different business. Um, and because as Chadley mentioned, they can overlap without knowing um, the nuts and bolts of it. And that's really where farmers as business owners come together and not just farmers too, right? You have other community members, maybe you have a pop-up shop, maybe you have a food truck. We don't, I don't know what it is. Maybe you have someone who's just selling the experience, a recreational guide, um, but the impact will matter on how it's designed. And we're certainly in a time in the U.S. where, where you can infuse the conversation um, and, and don't be bashful about having um, multiple voices at the table because that's what's going to be successful. It's, it's a recipe for success. People, people figure it out eventually. <laughs> well, it sounds like you do a lot of this work, Anne. Um, and the agritourism conference um, in your in Maine was that just a standalone event, or will it become an annual thing? It'll become an annual event. And to be candid, a lot of it was to help me uh, because if you heard, you may have heard I do a lot of different things. Um, but a lot of it was to help me just kind of 
focus my time, right? Um, this this is where it benefits, or if you're working with farmers and you've been a farmer, you know how to budget your time. So um, so it helps me do that, but it also helps me coincide with other events that are happening. We have continuing education credits. So people are our are, are captive audience and we know they're gonna come there for crop and research updates. They're probably gonna come in to learn about pests, things like that. And they're going to look at the equipment. So we added this summit to this 80 plus year old event. And it was one of the most well attended activities. And if I need someone to go and meet um, a soil scientist on board, they can come there. Um, and then we've also modified all these conferences to include uh, farmer panels, because ultimately, you know, I, I could maybe I could win the lottery. I don't even play. But let's say I did. Right. Um, I'm gone, or maybe the resources that I um, was so lucky to inherit, if you will, at, in this position, uh, those people might be retiring. And um, we wanna make sure that the farmers have successful experiences. And so bringing them together is what is beneficial to them. They can have a conversation if they wanna stay in business and they have awesome ideas too. Like you don't have to come up with the ideas, you have, just have to support them. And, and be a sounding board. And that's really the benefit of our summit. So they're already excited uh, to do it next year too. And your summit involves uh, staff members from the state tourism office as well? Yes, yep. We have a great working relationship um, actually through our, an output of fairs, right? So I know that the fair structures across the, the US look differently. Uh, New England has one big fair, it's called the Big E. So maybe it's, maybe it's as big as Minnesota, like, but like there's still thousands more people. Um, but we have people like parks, um, we have tourism who comes down and they're seeing more than a million people. So we've infused that relationship there. And I mentioned to people, I said, well, here's a baked potato. We have a few hundred thousand people who line up for a baked potato and our tourism folks see that. And then they want to know the story. They're like, I mean, that's that's excellent hand-to-hand -hand marketing opportunities yeah. there, right? It's like, how many brochures can you give out? How many potatoes have you sold? And then the, the brainstorm happens and people get so excited about it because it's so good and they're so proud of where they are featuring their products. Um, it's a natural relationship. And like I said, it's it's easy for, um, for a destination um, outpost, if you will, that maybe doesn't have a lot of resources, but but maybe the ag side has put more resources in just by nature of having that support. So our tourism team is is pretty helpful. And they actually came on um, a really nice tour. We finished up, we're finishing up our courses, but we did a, a show and tell tour as a, a function of the course. And we had two tourism folks on. Um, and then we did a visit to a tasting center as well. So everyone was involved there and it really um, it really clicked and we'll probably do more tours. Um, we'll look at policy or planner tours as well because nice. we have the resources to do that. Um, but but it doesn't, it, again, it's generations of effort, right? Events like Open Farm Day, that was a 40 year, um, you know, May, May Maple Sunday, those are 40 year traditions. And so the tradition itself is collaboration, which Chadley highlighted um, and which I mentioned you can't have it if people aren't willing to work together. Well said. Mike, any other questions, folks in yeah, the audience? I think we have we have one more, it's more of a, a statement, but you guys can weigh in on it. And then I think we should uh, go ahead and close, close down. Uh, there seems to be a push supporting agroforestry by, US, by, US, by UDSA. Uh, if you bring the agroforestry idea to agritourism, the world should, should open up more possibilities for ag and forestry farmers. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, in Maine, we are the most forested state um, in the nation. And um, I think where Chadley is residing currently, Georgia, you hear a lot of like the silvo pasturing. Um, you know, th there's a great big brand about that. So I, I would tend to agree. And of course, maple syrup, you know, there's an argument for that about forestry. <laughs> I, I think a forester um, might 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 disagree between you know the woodlot and the forestry thing, but it's it's educational and and that's what matters awareness about what these rural businesses are doing because it helps all of us. We don't exist without these businesses. Yeah, I that was that last piece that Ann said was going to be my main response to that, and I think I think broadly globally um, in our communities we're learning that you know, our landscape is meant to be integrated into our lives, right? And and that's that's sort of the philosophy behind agroforestry, right? 
um, um, you know, co-planting, um, you know, a, a forestry structure with a with an agricultural structure that um, that if you know that shouldn't be completely separate from from our life, right? It it feeds us. It, it's it's everything we're about. So um, I think it's it's tremendously educational for folks uh, of all walks of life to see that um, to understand that agriculture isn't out and our food doesn't come from. I mean, it might come from some other faraway place, but it also comes from right in our backyard. And, and I think that's important. So, yes, great yeah. storytelling, sense of place. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, panelists and Mike. And for all of you folks that joined this webinar today on ag uh, agritourism, stay tuned next month where this tourism skill shop dives into best practices for family friendly travel. All right. We'll see you again soon. Take care.